Welcome to Cambridge Health Alliance Health is Well. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm Director of Marketing and Outreach for the Geriatric Division of the Cambridge Health Alliance, including the PACE program. And today we have with us Jaime Silva. And uh, Jaime is in the ENT department, which is? Yeah, it's the ear, nose, and throat or otolaryngology department. Oh. Okay, yeah. and um, we are going to, you're a PA in that department, is that correct? That's right, and uh, the PA in the ENT department at CHA. So, a physician assistant in ear, nose, and throat. We're talking all these acronyms, so yeah. we forget that not everyone understands, right? Right. And today we're going to talk about a very prevalent and important subject, which is GERD, or acid reflux, or? Well, um, in ENT, what we see... What is the no, the, it is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Mouthful. Right, and we see it a <laughs> Not lot. Not intended. <laughs> that's true, yeah. And we do see it a lot in the ENT department, um, just because people are, don't realize that they can have symptoms in their throat, um, and sometimes it can only be symptoms in their throat, what we, which we call silent reflux. Silent? Um, silent reflux. So like um, the GERD, the reflux part of the disease, or... People, most people, I would say, feel just heartburn, but mm -hmm. when we see them in the ENT department, some people just come, come in presenting with throat pain. Oh. And, um, like sore throat pain? or It could be like a sore throat pain or a feeling like there's something stuck in their throat. Oh. Um, sometimes it could be difficulty swallowing or um, just pain swallowing, pain with swallowing liquids or solids or sometimes just swallowing. I thought mostly it was like the acid bubbling up and burning. So that could be, I mean, so that is a very classic symptom of mm. reflux or gastroesophageal mm. reflux. But um, but in, in the ENT department, you know, if somebody, if your primary care doctor sends you to see one of us um, for throat pain, um, you know, we tend to ask lots of questions to see, you know, if maybe the throat pain that someone's having can actually be from from reflux or from heartburn. Can you tell me what kind of questions you would ask? Well, if somebody would um, were to, to come in and say that they have just, you know, a constant sensation in their throat, like there's something stuck there, or if they were to just complain about a cough that seems to not go away or not be getting better, um, or a sensation like there's something stuck there, or, you know, difficulty swallowing, um, one of the first questions I would ask is if they have heartburn. Yeah. And in my experience, some, most people say, you know, every now and then they have heartburn, but that's not what bothers them the most. What bothers them the most is the throat pain. Or um, they might say that they, have, that they don't have heartburn, like I mentioned, which, uh, you know, we would call silent reflux. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know... We would ask all these. We would ask questions related to maybe what could lead us to a diagnosis or to maybe help someone's symptoms. But um, you know, additionally, we might also ask um, about the voice if somebody's voice has changed. Um, it can affect that too. It can, yeah. It mm. can affect somebody's the tissue around their vocal cords and you know affect somebody's voice. Um, and, you know, a, a history, right? A social history, asking about um, whether or not they've been smokers or asking about their diet. Um, asking how, you know, not only what kind of foods they eat, but also asking, you know, how much coffee they drink, um, yeah. how much water they drink, uh, how many times they might um, eat in a day. You know, some people, if, you know, eat small meals a day, and that's preferable actually when people have this condition. But if they eat just one big meal a day and then go to bed right after, or just three big meals a day, then that could be uh, problematic for somebody who has reflux. Mm. So, uh, and would you do other testing as well? Or how do you test? Is there a test for uh, GERD? There, there are tests. Um, you know, in in general, if somebody comes in and you know, for the first time saying that they have these symptoms um, to their primary care doctor. You know, the one, one good test actually, um, you know, after, you, after the history is taken and after, you know, your 
your primary care doctor or nurse practitioner or physician assistant asks all the relevant questions. Um, you know, and they suspect that acid reflux is the cause of either the throat pain or the heartburn. Um, you know, one acceptable test is to, you know, to try certain types of medication to see if it, if the symptoms respond to it. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they do, then um, you can with confidence say that the symptoms are probably related to acid reflux. And as long as people are feeling better, you know, sometimes you don't need additional tests. Mm -hmm. Um, but by the time they come to see a specialist, like um, an ENT provider or a gastroenterologist, they might have tried some of these things or they might have some symptoms that are not very typical. Um, so can, mm -hmm. so the, uh, one of the medicines I know would be like omeprazole, which yes. would, is that Prilosec? Is that correct? Omeprazole is Prilosec, omeprazole. Yes. right. So I, this is an, a question I have. Is the omeprazole that you buy over the counter the same as uh, what would be prescribed, or is it a lower dosage, or is there no difference? Uh, so you could buy uh, the 20 milligram prescription over the counter, and you can, I believe you can also buy a 10 milligram dosage over the counter, um, but, and so, and usually um, you'll be prescribed 20 milligrams actually, okay. but some, some providers will prescribe 40 milligrams. Oh. Um, and some depending people, on how severe, depending on how severe the symptoms are, or um, you know, depending on how severe it is, and um, you know, also usually, you know, you can take it once a day or twice a day, either the twenty milligram or forty milligram. Usually, um, you know, if you're just buying it over the counter, I think the twenty milligram would be sufficient. But if you feel like you have to take more, then it's a good reason to see somebody. Hmm. Mm. So that was a question I had because I, I see that it is over the counter, but I didn't know it was the same. So thank you for that yeah. uh, clarification. So you did mention uh, food. Yes. And you mentioned uh, meals. And so are there some foods that would um, irritate and cause the flare up and there others are. that might cool it? They're mostly. Um it's usually foods, the foods that we usually talk about in clinic are the ones that, that can cause symptoms or exacerbate symptoms. And, um, but not only the foods, but the, the frequency of meals, the timing of them, you know, those can uh, play a big role in symptoms and, and managing the symptoms. So there are certain acidic foods mm -hmm. um, and certain delicious foods that, you know, it would, uh, that, Maybe it may not be the best for people who have, you know, symptoms or who are still having heartburn, beside, you know, despite taking medication. Um, and Can you tell us what those are? So um, one big one that people are surprised about is chocolate. And, chocolate. Yeah, so, so chocolate's something that we tell people, you know, they should avoid or limit when, when they have heartburn or when they have some of these symptoms that are caused by heartburn or reflux. So that would be all chocolate. It's not like the darker chocolate would have a lesser effect. All chocolate. Right. So it would be just chocolate and yeah, so chocolate, milk, Sorry, chocolate, chocolate, white chocolate. Yeah. Uh, you know, acidic food like citrus juices, orange juice, grapefruit juice, lemonade, um, tomato sauce. Mm. Unfortunately. Um, so that pizza. Pizza. Um, yeah. Greasy foods. Greasy. Um, fried foods, in other words. Right, right fried foods, um, potato chips, and um, also um, I did mention the acidic foods, so yeah. But, and also um, not only the types of foods, but the, the meals. So we usually, we also, you know, people's, it's difficult for people to change their habits all, you know, drastically at once. So we usually tell people to start slow with, you know, avoiding some of these foods. Um, but also small meals can be really helpful. So um, if somebody eats multiple small meals per day, um, just because the stomach doesn't expand and cause too much pressure, it can be helpful rather than someone who eats maybe just one or two big meals per day. So is that what causes the acid to, when the stomach expands and has the pressure? Well, so when there's a lot of pressure, you know, the gastric juices, I guess you could say, go back up into the esophagus oh. and um, 
it, it, you get that burning sensation or sometimes the sensations in your throat. And um, there are, you know, certain foods that, um, you know, Trigger. prevent regulating oh. like you know the regulation or trigger you know that that acid from going up in there yeah so and what are some of the things that might cool it a little would bread does bread or anything with crackers or bread absorb any of the acid so i would say that in for the most part um there are there aren't foods that necessarily would be relieving you know if somebody's having symptoms and they just ate something and they want to eat something else you know i wouldn't necessarily recommend that but you know something like tums which is calcium carbonate it would um that does really cool it down and it does help uh, regulate the the acid and the um, and other mechanisms in the stomach and the esophagus that that help prevent the acid from going up so um, if this is chronic, and, and you know, we talk about what irritates it, if those are foods you love, and then how to cool it with the Tums, can that acid have an a, effect on us if it continues to bubble and burn? Can it make a hole in, in a Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so that, that's why you know, when you see your physician or when you see somebody about, the, about acid reflux symptoms, it's not just written off as something that, you know, just take some Tums when it happens and then just, you know, come back later. But because- Take you and call me in the morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it's something that can, you know, cause problems later if you don't treat it or if it's just not treated adequately, you know, so um, if you're talking about like ulcers, ulcers can happen and- um, And that an ulcer is a hole. An ulcer is a hole in the lining of, it could be the stomach or the intestine. Um, that, you know, it causes a lot of pain and, right. you know, chronic bleeding. Mm -hmm. and Not um, fun. No. <laughs> the other thing would be, um, you know, erosions in the esophagus or, you know, if, if there's a lot of, if there are a lot of changes to the, the tissue in the esophagus or the stomach, then things like cancer can come, in, come to play too. Mm. From the acid? Well, so from changes in the lining from, the from lots of acid, yeah. Hmm. Now that's an interesting point that I don't think I've ever thought of. Yes. And maybe you haven't either. Right. And that's why, you know, um, endoscopies are done commonly if somebody has symptoms that don't improve with and medication. And that's the, the camera that that's goes the down camera. through the nose? And, and so that would be, the... that's a, a laryngoscopy. Oh. So the one, there's a camera that goes in through the nose that's done in clinics that usually only requires local anesthesia um, that you know with that we're able to see um, your vocal cords and your the inside of your throat and the endoscopy is usually done in the operating room um, and that you know a gastroenterologist is able to see a little bit better into the esophagus and into the stomach and into the very top of the intestine do you put a camera down as well and take pictures while they? They take pictures when they do it they usually. Do it. So yeah. he can, or he or she can see as well as capture they're, it on film. They're able to see, capture some pictures. They're able to do biopsies and oh. make sure that there are no anatomical abnormalities or, or ulcers that, right. or changes in the lining that seem suspicious. Um, test for bacteria. Um, you mean like that H. pylori? Exactly, like mm. H. pylori. Um, and so, you know, they're able to really visualize what's going on exactly when somebody has these symptoms and actually directly look. Um, but, um, you know, so sometimes that's necessary, right? Mm. So maybe in progression, if they try some treatment and then uh, and doesn't seem to work, then they might go for more... You know, right, or if you know this somebody, or if you know somebody's highly suspicious that there could be an ulcer just based on their symptoms, or um, you know if somebody's bleeding or coughing up blood, or they have labs that show that there might be a you know chronic bleeding, definitely. Um, then definitely, you know, they don't have to just try the meds first. But it's true. I mean, usually, um, you know, these are, I would say these situations are more rare and usually um, people do try medication first and it usually is helpful. Hmm. 
So um, you mentioned eating uh, late. So when if you eat late and lie down, that could be a problem, right? Because it could be. Why? It causes pressure. And then, the, again, the same thing we were talking about, the gastric juices then are forced back up. Is that am that's, I understanding No, that's this? basically it. I mean, it's... Um, if you, you could think of it as like plumbing, right? I mean, so if there's food that's in the stomach that hasn't been digested yet and you lie down, um, you know, then there are, you know, then that food or the, you know, the, the gastric juices also, like you said, they just go back up and, um, and the, the system itself refluxes, right? So that, that there's food or juice or gastric juices that go back up into the esophagus and, and people are asleep at that time, so they might not feel it. And um, so that could also be a point in time where people are actually causing damage to their throat and to their esophagus and not realizing it. Mm -hmm. um, they might wake up in the morning feeling like their throat hurts and think, oh, it's just normal. Maybe the uh, air in my room is dry and, um, you know, I wake up like this and then I feel better and don't actually have heartburn. But it could be that it's happening at night. Mm. And this is um, so. This is what we see quite a bit of. In, so, in what's a recommended amount of time between last meal and lying down? So, two to three hours two is actually three. recommended. Two to three hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, there's a lot to this, and it, there's so it, many people out here that have it. Right. It's it's very common. Very common. Much more. Are we just hearing about it more, or is it? Are we just eating worse, or our habits are really gone? A muck or all of them? <laughs> it's a combination of things, probably. You know, so I think that this in this day and age, people are a lot more aware of their their bodies and and healthcare now. With you know, you can Google your symptoms. You can check, you know, with the internet. Like we have a lot of information at our fingertips, and you can really understand things that are happening to you. And you can get some good information when you look for things. So people are. I would say people now are more aware of what, what goes on in their bodies and don't only rely on their healthcare practitioners to tell them. But I would say that um, our diets are changing. You know, um, Americans, we are becoming, you know, more obese and, you know, obesity, obesity is a risk factor. Um, because again of the pressure? Exactly. Because of the pressure. Um, increased pressure. Which makes sense. Right. Makes right. sense. Um, and then meals, you know, we eat, we eat bigger meals at restaurants, um, and then, you know, in our We culture, feel cheated if we don't get a decent portion, right? right? doesn't mean we have to eat all of it at one time. That's true. We can take half of it home. Right, exactly. And we're accustomed to eating three meals a day, right? Mm. That's, um, I would say that's how most of us probably grew up, um, I, at least I did, and, um, you know, and... It's okay, as long as they're three... It's fine. Healthy yeah, meals. it's fine. As long as they're <laughs> right. three healthy meals and um, as long as they're not, you know, three really large meals and, um, you know, but if somebody is having these symptoms, then we would say maybe eat smaller meals and you don't have to more reduce. Often. Right, more often. You don't have to reduce the amount of calories you take in or anything necessarily, but um, just smaller meals mm. um, spaced so out throughout the day. Your body can handle it and process it. So is there? So this can lead to other things, as as we were saying, right? The the throat, and that's your specialty, right? Your nose, throat. Right. It it definitely could. So um, some people um, come in with a chronic cough. Uh, so uh, I would say that you know a chronic cough. Uh, when we see them in the ENT department, you know one of the first two things we think are well, one of the first things we think about is um, acid reflux. And then another thing we think about is post-nasal drip, which is a totally different topic, right? But mucus dripping down from the back of the nose and irritating the throat. But, um, but some what people... What about smoking? Don't you check that first? Well, we do. So we always want to know if somebody's a smoker and if they have a chronic cough or throat pain. Right? Right. So, and the nice thing is that if we're in the ENT department, we have all the, the tools at our disposal to check and make sure that there's no... Um, you know, no tumor, no cancer, anything from somebody who's been a smoker for a long time. Mm. Um, but, right, so if somebody comes in with a chronic cough and they, they're a smoker, then I would say then they would probably, um, you know, we would certainly work them up differently than if somebody was, you know, had a, maybe a chronic cough and they had some very classic reflux symptoms or like classic symptoms of 
you know, um, ob nasal obstruction that, or allergies that are causing post-nasal drip. Mm. Hmm. So, uh, right, so uh, you take one road or the other road depending on the history, right? Um, exactly. And the circumstances presented to you. Right. That makes sense. Right. That makes sense. So, uh, I know this is not on GERD topic, but uh, the question's just coming into my mind. If, so for a smoker who has a chronic cough, uh, is there a typical reason that that, I mean, I know you mentioned maybe a tumor or maybe uh, other uh, disease, but is there any other reason that a smoker might have a chronic cough? It could be. So there are um, there are vocal cord changes that can occur if somebody has been a smoker for um, for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then as we age as well, um, th our voices change. So the the vocal cord tissue changes as well. Um, Do they get like looser? It gets thinner. like everything else. <laughs> right. Right. No. Exactly. That's that's it. And so you know. You the might hear visit. you might hear like a shakier voice, or yeah. maybe just um, not as um, not as loud as it used to be, and so that can be you know something a normal variation as as we get older, the voice changes. But if somebody's a smoker and they have a sudden change in their voice, um, you know, or a chronic cough, then it's a good idea to to take a look, Check right? Like that laryngoscopy that we were talking about. Got a earlier. red flag flying, maybe. Yes, 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 it could be, but not to be, you know, um, I, I mean, I would say it's, it's definitely a reason to, to well, see But it's somebody. not normal, right. so then we need to check it out. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. not to send any alarm. <laughs> well, we have a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else with, uh, uh, um, related to the subject that you might think is important to tell our folks? Well, I would say that... Um, with the medication related to acid reflux, um, like the omeprazole or Prilosec that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that um, basically the, I wouldn't say that the medication will just completely cure it, right? I would say that the important thing would be to consider the dietary changes involved with it. Um, the we lifestyle. can never get away from that. Right. <laughs> right. We're always talking about that on this show, but it's important. Yes, right? exactly. And, and we mean, can, only we can control that. Yeah, exactly. And not only important with, um, you know, the ear, nose, and throat or reflux, but in lots of different aspects of health. General well-being. Right. Um, but I would say, so not to just um, maybe rely on the medication to help, but... You know, the diet and lifestyle changes are probably just as, if not maybe more important in some situations, right? So, um, you know, like, like I said, the, the smaller meals, avoiding um, certain foods, you know, that can cause, that can exacerbate some of the symptoms. What about exercise? Does that help at all? Well, exercise, you know, can help you, can help somebody like lose weight and um, in, in theory it could help. Does it help the digestive process? It doesn't process necessarily. I mean, it, it does it up help. or anything? I mean, it helps metabolism, mm -hmm. you know, so it can be helpful. But, um, but I would say, you know, at, you know, exercise can help in that situation. Um, and, you but know. But not directly, indirectly probably. I would say more indirectly, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and actually clothing. So looser fitting clothing is one of the things that is also helpful. Oh. Which, <laughs> so like nothing tight around the waist we do tell people yeah nothing tight around the waist nothing um, basically around the waist or around the abdomen um, you know again it would cause pressure and cause the that's basically it and that, that that's system the whole to reflex thing, right yeah. when it comes back this way mm -hmm. okay um, so anything else before we uh, get ready to sign off at this time any other important uh, or any um, Anything you want to leave them with? I would say, um, you know, I guess to, to maybe, if I were to think of some closing remarks, I would probably say, you know, just to um, take into consideration, you know, the, um, you know, acid reflux or um, GERD, as we called it, the gastroesophageal reflux disease, if, if you're experiencing a chronic cough that doesn't get better, or throat symptoms, you know, pain in the in your throat, 
or difficulty swallowing, um, rather than, you know, um, thinking that it's an infection, maybe just to kind of pay attention to, um, to some of these things that we talked about today, maybe some of the foods that somebody might be eating or the habits that they have, um, if, if they're experiencing these symptoms. They can change them around and see if they get any relief, right. any changes. Exactly. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think that this is um, a, an important subject, I know, because I hear about it all the time in the community, and our folks um, are bothered by it, obviously, because it gets in the way. Right. Right? It's an uncomfortable feeling, it gets in the way, um, and as we said, it could, if, if left there, uh, the acid could actually do some damage and, and we want to catch it before it does do any damage, like burn any holes in either the stomach or the esophagus. Exactly. Right? Because that is always more pain and, um, and uh, more discomfort right. Right? and leads to other things. Yes, absolutely. So, great. So, um, I think we just have a, another few seconds to go. Uh, it, Ear, nose, and throat, any other um, direct correlations that we might be able to just tell our folks quickly about? Uh, well, I know I did um, talk a little bit about post-nasal drip possibly cause it, uh, causing a chronic cough. So um, one of the things that I would say that we tell a lot of our patients to do if they have um, a lot of congestion or if they feel like they have a runny nose um, and they're also coughing is... Um, saline rinses mm. or you know normal saline that a saline spray that so can, a nose spray a nose spray so that's something very uh, straightforward and simple or also those um it's, it, i think it's called neil med which is a sinus irrigation system a neti pot it's it's the same makers as a neti pot yeah. exactly mm. um so if you use like clean water or distilled water and one of those uh salt packets and put it in there um that can really help it, it can end up helping with that post-nasal drip if that seems to be causing people an irritation in their throat or a, a chronic cough as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, to Jaime, for, <laughs> for uh, joining us today. Great. There's a lot of information for our folks, and I'm sure they find it useful. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So until next time.